No matter what your horse's job is, we've got you covered. OCD Pellets is a revolutionary bone and joint supplement that maintains, protects, and restores joints and bone in horses in all stages of life, even in utero. It helps with conditions such as OCDs, bone fractures, arthritis, and more. Give your equine athlete the care they deserve. Build stronger bone and healthier joints with OCD Pellets. Hi, my name is Gary Falter with the Jockey Club. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's online panel. And today we have a panel of three remarkable veterinarians that will cover a variety of equine health issues. And if you're viewing the panel live and have a question for any of the veterinarians, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And to allow us to answer as many questions as possible, be sure to keep your questions brief and relevant to the topics presented today. The Owner Conference Series is hosted by the Jockey Club and the Thoroughbred Owners and Breeders Association. I'd also like to recognize our sponsors, starting with our presenting sponsors, Bessemer Trust, Dean Dorton Equine, and Stoll Keenan Ogden. And today's panel is sponsored by Mersant International and OCD Pellets. Our sincere thanks to all the sponsors for their continued support of Thoroughbred Ownership. Now, for the next three months, we're taking a break from the virtual panels to focus our efforts on the in-person owner conference scheduled to be held in Saratoga on July 25th and 26th. And if you plan to attend the Saratoga conference, visit our website, ownerview.com, to view the schedule and to register. Our next virtual panel is scheduled for Tuesday, September the 6th. We hope you enjoy today's panel. And our moderator is Horse Racing Radio Network's founder, Mike Penna. Thank you, Mike, for being with us today, and please take it from here. All right, Gary, thank you so much for the, uh, for the introduction and really looking forward to that panel coming up in Saratoga later, later this year. This is, uh, let's see, the eighth consecutive year that I've had the privilege to be part of one of the owner view panels, whether it be online or in person. I remember that first one back in 2014 at Keeneland, and today... Today won't disappoint you. We have three of the top equine veterinarians in the sport of thoroughbred racing, and they're going to share some wonderful insights. And it seems like every time that I've had the privilege to be part of uh, moderating a panel with veterinarians, it the response is just unbelievable. So I think you're really going to enjoy it here today and uh, looking forward to what they have to say. So you didn't come here to hear me talk. You came here to hear them. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with that for you now. Let me introduce each of the panelists. You know, it's funny, I remember in 2014, I also didn't need these at that point eight years ago, but I'm going to put them on here today so I don't mess up their introductions. Uh, let's start with Dr. Larry Bramlage, who graduated from the Kansas State University College of Veterinary Medicine in 1975. He received a Master of Science degree from Ohio State in 1978, an equine orthopedic surgeon, partner in Root and Riddle Equine Hospital in Lexington. He is a past president of the American Association of Equine Practitioners and the American College of Veterinary Surgeons. He's also a TV star participating in the on-call program to provide veterinary expertise during media coverage of major horse racing events. So please welcome Dr. Larry Bramlage, who joins us here today. Doc, appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. Well, secondly is Dr. Lisa Fortier, and I feel like we should have gone ladies first, but I'm, I'm going in order here, Lisa, so thanks for being with us. She is the James Law Professor of Surgery at Cornell University. 
She's the editor in chief of the Journal of American Veterinary Medical Association. She is the editor in chief of the American Journal of Veterinary Research and has 30 years of experience focused on improving veterinary medicine through her expertises as a surgeon, clinician, author, editor, scientist, and educator. Dr. Lisa Fortier. Doc, appreciate you being with us. Thanks for having me. And finally, Dr. Steve Reed. Dr. Reed earned his DVM at The Ohio State University, followed by a residency at Michigan State University. He spent 26 years as a professor and mentor in the equine medicine department at Ohio State. Dr. Reed is a diplomate in the American College of Veterinary International or Internal Medicine and is noted as an author and editor of numerous scientific articles and textbooks. Currently, he is the internal medicine specialist and shareholder of the practice at Root and Riddle Equine Hospital. Doc, Dr. Steve Reed, Doc, appreciate you being along with us here today. Thanks, Mike. Looking forward to it. Yeah, looking forward to the conversation. I want to know how Gary Falter ended up getting two Buckeyes out of the three doctors on this panel. I know Gary's a Buckeye, so how did that work out? Accident, I guess. <laughs> I don't think that's any accident. <laughs> I think he just knew what was good. And as Dr. Bramwich said, he, he got his Kansas State degree for vet medicine and then Ohio State for the residency in <laughs> Great. Well, I'm looking forward to these conversations here today. I think we're going to have a lot of fun. I know each of you has a presentation you're going to make, uh, but before we jump into those presentations, I'd like to start by asking each of you to answer a couple of questions. And first, um, I guess we'll go to Dr. Bramlage. No, you know what? Let's go to Dr. Fortier first. We will do ladies first in this respect. Uh, Dr. Fortier, what do you think has been the most noteworthy advance in veterinary medicine in recent years, a medication, a piece of equipment, the eradication of a disease. I'm going to give each of you a chance to answer this question, but Dr. Fortier, take it away. What do you think? Yeah, thank you. I, to me, the one that would be the most important across the species, whether it's racehorses, performance horses, humans, or dog athletes, is PET CT. So we all know what a CT scan is, but that's really it is three-dimensional, but like an x-ray, it doesn't really tell you what is biologically active. A PET CT scan, which is really being uh, led by the group at Davis, there are others that have it, but the Davis group is really far ahead of everybody else when looking at PET CT scans and racehorses. And this will really help us identify and be able to correlate to less invasive methods to see who's at risk, how are rehab methods working, how are medications working and all those sorts of things. So for me, it would be PET CT. Dr. Bramlage, your thoughts. I'm going to take a little bit broader view. In my career, I think the most significant development was the advent of the uh, anti-parasitic drugs that eliminated Strongylus vulgaris. That used to be the disease that killed most horses, and that was the that, that was a parasite that migrated inside the blood vessels um, as a larvae, and it caused the thromboembolic colics where when I started practicing, an old horse was in the early 20s. Now it's nothing for a horse to go into the 30s. And, the, and that is pretty much all the result of better wormers. So I, you know, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, but I have to go with an internal medicine development. Dr. Reed? Yeah, I think uh, uh, not the PET uh, CT, which is, as Lisa said, is has enhanced things so much. But just for me, uh, the use of CT and MRI on equine, you know, getting that equipment out there and getting it used on a regular basis for diagnostic, diagnosing uh, problems in particular, one of the ones that I'll talk about today. And then the other thing is on an in, uh, internal medicine related thing is uh, the recognition of equine parvoviruses. For years, this is not a really, really big problem, but recognizing, uh, you know, that the use of biologics like anti antitoxin was sometimes associated with induction of um, liver disease, and we didn't know why. And uh, the recognition by the people at Cornell to identify that particular uh, virus has been a really, really a big help. All right. Yeah, we're just getting started here. And if you are just joining us, we appreciate you being with us on this owner view panel. 
And if that's just the beginning, wait until you hear their presentations. It's going to be fantastic. One more question before we dive into those presentations. And, and Dr. Fortier, I will go ahead and start with you again. Um, when it comes to the advancements in the medical technology that we're seeing, how has that had an impact on racing? Oh, boy. Uh, you know, again, it all comes down to trying to identify those horses at risk. So, you know, again, we can go back to PET CT or CT or MRI, any of those imaging qualities. And eventually we'll be able to, I think, identify genetic factors, not just racing, how are people training and racing, but really getting back to genetic factors and what predispose horses for injury or, or sudden death that goes undiagnosed. Dr. Bramlage? Well, I think if you, if you lump the um, advent of digital imaging as compared to where I started, where we were using x-rays that you can hold in your hand, uh, digital imaging includes not only digital radiographs, but now ultrasounds, CTs. Um, you can send them anywhere you want for a second opinion or for informing owners. But just the, the digitization of all the information that we have, uh, computerization, I guess, maybe a better term. I'm not sure exactly the right term, but it enables us to move forward light years. And it also enables us to communicate on a level where we never used to be able to. Do you remember, Larry, at our, it was at a veterinary surgery meeting and we were all gathered around somebody's smartphone. We were like, you're looking at x-rays? How'd you do that? How'd you do that? Like that it is, it is revolutionary. And, you know, to be able to sit next to somebody and say, Hey, what do you think? It allowed yeah. us to move forward in many ways. Yeah. Pretty remarkable. Uh, Dr. Reed, how about your thoughts on the advancements in medical technology helping racing? Well, I think it, it, it goes right to what Lisa just said and what Larry's describing. And that is the, the use of uh, many applications that are available on our cell phone, but one that I think has had a huge impact is, and it was presented last year at the uh, Racing Safety Summit to talk about ways that you can monitor performance so that you can see uh, stride by stride changes in stride length that might be a predictor of what may happen to prevent a catastrophic injury. So the technology has just brought us way far forward in making uh, decisions before something bad happens. All right. Well, I appreciate your thoughts on those first two initial questions. We'll turn it over to the presentation portion of the, uh, of the conference now, and uh, we'll start with Dr. Lisa Fortier and, uh, and her presentation. Go right ahead, Doc. Great. I chose uh, for all those uh, controversies, uh, we were given an option on what to really present, and I'd like to discuss some options that are not, not just options, but I believe are better options than steroid for joint injections. And I'd preface by saying I don't believe that joint injections lead to catastrophic injury. I don't believe that they led to tendon rupture or any of those things. But for all the reasons that we know, we have options and we have better options. The first thing to do would be to back up and say, why are you wanting to get a horse injected? Or why is your veterinarian recommending a horse get injected? Could be a lot of reasons. It could be that's perceived source of pain. I think he's sore in the fetlocks, a little stiff behind. I think that's the stifles or the hocks not performing as well. So maybe some joints are getting a little bit tired. Uh, many of us do maintenance injections. Every year, my horse gets a left front, he has a little bit of a club foot. Every, every year, he gets a, a coffin joint injection. So just maintenance things to try and prevent those things that you know are going to recur. More than just supposing and assuming that we're going to have a problem, when you see something on an x-ray, such as degenerative joint disease or bone spavin, you might consider injecting that. A joint that has some fill post-racing could be post-surgery where the fill is not coming right down uh, to inject that as well. And this could be steroids or acid or any of those things, but just really framing the discussion on why are all the reasons that we might consider injecting joints. What's really important to remember is when you're injecting something into a joint, what are you really targeting? And that helps you try to understand what, what to choose from. So this is a schematic of a front to back of a knee joint. So this would be the thigh bone, the shin bone would be down here. 
the gray is the bone, the blue is the cartilage that covers the joint. And the cartilage you can't see because it's on an x-ray because it's 90% water. But what cartilage does is absorbs the compression. So it's like the sneaker, the rubber on your sneaker before it gets to the bone. Interestingly and importantly is cartilage does not have any blood supply. So it has no way to get nutrition except for the fluid, the joint fluid that surrounds the cartilage. It also has no way to get rid of the waste because it doesn't have any blood vessels. So again, that's the joint capsule or the inside of the joint capsule that's called the synovial membrane. And that's really important because the synovial membrane is what produces inflammation. It is what responds to infection. It's what produces the acid, the hyaluronan that gives the joint lubrication. Nutrition, again, removes and removes uh, waste products. So when you're injecting a joint, you're treating and probably affecting all of these things, the bone, the cartilage, and the joint capsule, very, very importantly. If there's ligaments in here, like your cruciate ligament, you would be affecting those as well. Now, again, when you have an arthritic joint, and this could be a fetlock, a, a neck, anything, what really happens is all the money, all the business is coming from this joint capsule. It's the joint capsule that produces the enzymes that degrade the cartilage, the inflammatory, and, and causes pain. All the pain comes from the joint capsule in early arthritis. Once you have exposed and the bone gets to be painful, that's different. But in the horses that we're talking about early on, not the pod disease, but the ones that have true joint inflammation, joint fill, the money that you're looking for is in the joint capsule itself. When you're looking at an x-ray, again, this is the front and back of a horse stifle. You can't see the joint capsule, which would be coming along here. You can't see the cartilage to be down here because there's no mineral in it. And so you're, you're looking at this and you're saying, oh, I think the horse is sore in the stifle. And you're presuming that the cartilage is normal, which is down here at a, looking at a normal cartilage in a scope. It's beautiful. Normal cartilage actually has um, the viscosity, the uh, slipperiness of cartilage. Normal cartilage is less than that of ice on ice. So normal cartilage is super, super slippery as it should be. However, when you have arthritis, as in the case over here, uh, this is way too late for steroids or anything else that we have, biologics or any, this is time for a joint replacement. You can see the joint is collapsed over here, gigantic bone spur, and down here, this, uh, this cartilage now looks like shag carpet. And you can see how thick, really super thick this joint capsule is. So again, that joint capsule would be really stiff. And every time that, and maybe this happens to you and all the things that I'm gonna to say today are not just important for your horse, but these apply to you as a patient uh, and to your dog or other beloved animal as well. So this is where the pain comes from is, is that joint capsule getting stiff and stretching because that's where the nerve fibers are too. Cartilage, not only the cartilage at the end of the bone, not only doesn't have any blood supply, but it doesn't have any nerve endings. So the pain comes from either the bone or the joint capsule. And that's important, not because it's just good anatomy to know, but it's important when you know when you're uh, choosing a medication. So lots of us, including myself, still use steroids and they're a, a, a great thing to have in your, in your treatment kit, but there are some pluses and minuses. The pluses of course, is that it's very, very potent. It kills pain, it decreases inflammation, there's nothing like it. The steroids are very, very potent. The three main ones used in joint injections in horses, there are others, are Venolog, also known as Kenolog in some cases, Betavet, and Depomedrol. And generally in this order, that's how long they last and how potent they are. Uh, depends on the study you look at, but that's pretty general. A lot of people think they're going to use steroids, not only because they're potent, but they're touted to be less expensive than any other uh, than any other biologic that I'll talk about. And I, I might contend that a little bit as we move along. The biggest, one of the great advantages about steroids is they're right there in the truck, right? Everybody has these on their truck and you just pull them off. You don't have to make any preparation method uh, in order to get to them. The cons, however, is a, just like it is a pro that steroids are very, very potent. So will humans and dogs and horses do things that they shouldn't do when they've had steroids because you've killed the pain? Yes. Am I saying that leads to breakdown injury? No, but you could, they would, and humans do this too, could overtrain because you've taken away uh, the vast majority of their pain. No doubt this is the biggest deterrent to use of steroids in horses. 
is drug testing. And of course, there's lots and lots of studies that say what the withdrawal time is, but it can vary from horse to horse and uh, lots of different reasons that it can vary. So it's very, very tricky and certainly uh, not a good thing to have happen uh, to be uh, caught with a horse with steroid traces. A big disadvantage of steroids is that they do not provide any way to protect the joint. They decrease inflammation and pain, but unlike the biologics that I'll show you, they don't actually help protect the joint from further damage. And then one thing that goes highly untalked about is this concept of steroid euphoria. And for any of you that have had a steroid injection in your shoulder, your knee, or your plantar fascia, or your dog, <laughs> uh, most of you will know what I'm talking about, uh, but may not have known what you were experiencing. And I don't know about uh, Larry and Steve, but for me, it, it, we get everything that we inject in joints, every joint injection has a risk, it's small, but of getting an infection. In my hands, Depomedrol, I'm very, I, I'm much less likely to be able to cure that infection and save that horse if it got injected with Depomedrol compared to beta vet uh, and, or Vetalog. So in my practice, I don't use Depomedrol at all um, because of this very, very slight risk. And in, in my practice, I don't think it's necessary when we have beta vet and Vetalog. So steroid euphoria, we have an adage, a saying in veterinary medicine that we learn and it says no animal should die without the benefit of steroids. And that is because you can take a dog or a cat that is really, really on their last leg and give them steroids and all of a sudden they pop up and they're running around and they eat like crazy. Um, and, and you can get them over and get them to live for a little while longer so it can give them a little bit better quality of life for a while. A lot of times it, it definitely stimulates appetite. So many, many people and animals that are on steroids, uh, they get very heavy just because it's almost an uncontrolled appetite that stimulates in the central appetite center. But this is the part that bothers me the most is this anxiety and insomnia that is described, well described in humans. So the risk here is that you inject a horse with steroids and it starts to go great. It's running like it's never run before. And so you think, oh, well, then it definitely had a hawk problem because Doc put hawk steroids into that hawk and now he's a whole bunch better. But the problem is the horse could just be euphoric from the steroids. So if your horse does really well on steroids for a couple of weeks and then it starts to wear off at around week three or four, it's probably an effect of the euphoria versus the actual effect of the steroids killing inflammation. Sometimes that can be a really good thing to get the horse over the hump of a little bit of pain and get them to start to build up muscle. But just keep this idea of anxiety and insomnia and euphoria in the back of your mind. It's very common after steroid injections. But I really want to talk about what you should you consider that are actually better than steroids and their biologics. There's lots and lots of biologics and each one of these would take an entire week on its own to discuss. And the one I want to talk about uh, primarily is platelet-rich plasma because it has the most evidence. I'm going to touch on Arthromid and Noltrex in the bottom because they're really up and coming uh, and they're just as easy to use, a little more expensive. People say, well, platelet-rich plasma doesn't work. And I'm telling you, it has the highest level of evidence in human medicine possible. The evidence also suggests that it works better and lasts longer than steroids, HA or acid, or the combination of those two. So if you don't think the PRP, play the rich plasma works for joint pain, then you aren't reading enough. It's th there's that strong of evidence. The recent survey also shows that 87% of equine vets, regardless of the discipline in sports medicine are using biologics to treat their patients. So this isn't just for racehorses. So what is platelet rich plasma? It's essentially you take an animal or a human patient's blood and you put it in some type of disposable device like this and you centrifuge it, get rid of the red blood cells, and then you're left with a liquid portion of blood, which is called plasma. What we're really after are these tiny, tiny dots called platelets. These are about a, a piece of horse mane. The softest piece of mane that you can pull would be about 150 times larger than a platelet. So these are tiny. And this is what they look like um, on a cellular level up here. So the idea is that we're going to concentrate these platelets by spinning down this blood and in those platelets, that's where your body stores all these growth factors. And growth factors are what are important for rebuilding and repairing tissue. We also know that when used into a joint that they are anti-inflammatory to the same level of steroids. 
unlike steroids, they increase joint lubrication because they increase synthesis, natural synthesis of acid, and they slow cartilage deterioration. So steroids have this going for them. It's anti-inflammatory, but they don't have the other things that biologics have going for it. Quite simple to make, not as easy as pulling steroids off the shelf. I will absolutely agree with that. You need a patient. We do do a sterile prep on the neck and use sterile gloves. Again, it's going into a joint, so we have to be very careful in how we make this. Put it into a centrifuge, and five to 10 minutes later, you have your platelet-rich plasma. A huge problem in the platelet-rich plasma area is there's many, many ways to make it. Here's just one of the rows of machines in my laboratory. There's at least three times as many ways as this to make platelet-rich plasma. So I'm going to reiterate, why would you use this when steroids work? Uh, because it's not only anti-inflammatory, they're regenerative. It works better. PRP works better and longer than steroids or acid or the combination. This is not a drug. Even if you could think, oh, it's blood, it could be blood doping. The World Anti-Doping Association has already gone around and around about this. At first, they're like, ooh, it's blood doping. And then they did a bunch of other studies because the growth factors, right? You think, ooh, growth factors, and you think, human growth factor and all kinds of other things. Uh, so this is PRP is water approved in humans and has never been uh, up for controversy to any significant extent in the equine industry. However, it's not a miracle. If steroids aren't working, it's not like then, well, what about that PRP stuff? Let's try and see if that works. It, it's, a, it's an option to use instead of steroids, not when steroids fail. I said earlier, a lot of people say, well, it's really much more expensive but that's not really true. The majority of the money that you spend on a joint injection is for all the other things, the drugs to sedate the horse, the preparation material, all the other things. So really, when you look at what PRP compared to steroids cost me as a veterinarian, it's actually just about $25. It depends, I showed you the whole row of machines. It could depend on the type of uh, a machine that you use, but it's not, it's not cost prohibitive. It should not double the cost of your, of your joint injection. As I said, you don't use this when steroids don't work. You want to inject it when the joint looks normalish. So again, perceived joint pain, but the x-rays are looking pretty normal. We don't see major signs of arthritis in this ankle or in this knee. Here's normal cartilage, and that's what normal cartilage looks like on histology beautiful purple all the way down to the bone down here. If you have this kind of remodeling on the sesamoid bone where you see it looks like this little beak up here, some arthritis or bone spurs, again, that same uh, x-ray I showed you earlier. Now you have exposed bone, You've all the cells in the cartilage are dead. This is not when PRP or steroids or anything is going to work. This, these lower ones would be very unlikely for a racehorse, but maybe more for any of us as panelists probably have a little bit of this in our knee. Uh, and this wouldn't be uncommon up here for a, a late term racehorse. Uh, but again, uh, just to reiterate that biologics are not a miracle cure. A treatment protocol is typically one injection response. There's a lot of studies. Do you need one injection, two, three, four? If I inject a horse once and it doesn't respond, I don't inject it again. That means that horse is not going to respond to this platelet-rich plasma, and it probably wouldn't have re responded to steroids. So you either got the wrong place, you have the wrong joint, or uh, there's something else going on like bone pain that this will not address. Uh, some people will do a second injection or a third. I, I usually just do one. The other thing I wanted to really touch on that is becoming more common are these polyacrylamide gels. This started really in dressage horses and other sort of sport horses in Germany and, and other European countries. Then it came over here in sport horses, but it's really gaining foothold uh, in race horses as well. So these are two of the way, uh, types of polyacrylamide gels that are available. Uh, one is Noltrex. It's 4% polyacrylamide. It's made in some undisclosed location in Russia. Uh, and the other is Arthromid Vet, and it's less polyacrylamide. We don't know the difference. Some people say that 4% is too much. Uh, the, to me, the important thing is that you know that this is made in an FDA-approved facility, so you know that it has, it's consistent, it's sterile, uh, and you know what, where, where its source is. How this is supposed to work, how the evidence would suggest that these poly, this is that joint capsule again, so it all comes back to the joint capsule again, the polyacrylamide actually incorporates into the joint capsule, makes it a bit thicker, and they're more for more cushioned. When these polyacrylamides first came out, everybody said, oh, you won't see an effect for six weeks, so put some steroids in with them, and then 
you'll have the immediate effect of the steroid and the polyacrylamide gel. At least my experience is it doesn't take six weeks. It takes about a week for these to take effect uh, and, and completely resolve the lameness. Uh, this is uh, provided by Contura Veterinary as well. This is the manuscript of preparations. These are horses, race horses, that lameness was resolved within six weeks. So it could have been before that, but 83% of the lameness resolved uh, following Arthur vet infection whereas only 37% of the lameness resolved within the same time period with trancinolone or Kenalog Venalog. So it's looking like within the first six weeks or so that polyacrylamide is actually performing better than steroids as well. For me, it's a first line of defense, a very first line of defense, even over biologics or steroids or anything for coffin joint lameness, I go straight to Arthromid or Noltrex. And if I know in the stifle that we have something going on, here's again, not normal cartilage in a stifle. You can see how thick a joint capsule is again. And here it looks a little bit like a golf ball. If I know that I have these things, Arthromid or Noltrex are my first line of defense. Uh, I don't even bother with steroids or biologics anymore. So my point is you have options uh, and we have ways to get around using steroids that are probably better for the, they are better for the joint and work as well. Make sure you treat these animals in the early stage. You don't want to wait until they get bone spurs and other, um, and other irreversible sorts of damage. Make sure if surgery is indicated, if they have a chip fragment, then that needs to be taken care of and don't wait until it's too late. And the number one performance enhancing drug of all time is sleep. So if, you, if your horse is getting euphoric or all sorts of other things, then reconsider using steroids for that reason as well. But across the board in human medicine, this has been shown a million times, the best way to enhance your performance is to get sleep. And I will stop there. Well done, Dr. Fortier. Really appreciate that presentation. Thank you for the, uh, for the wonderful information. And I will remind all of you who are viewing this presentation today that if you do have a question from what you just heard Dr. Fortier talk about, you can go ahead and submit those to us as well. Um, so you can do that right there through the Q&A button um, and we'll go ahead and get to those after the presentations are completed. Uh, next, we're gonna turn our attention over to Dr. Reed who has some insight about several neurological diseases that are affecting thoroughbreds. So Dr. Reed, the stage is yours. Thank you, uh, Mike, and uh, really enjoyed listening to uh, Dr. Fortier, she's always a treat. Uh, but what they asked me to talk about today were uh, neurologic diseases. And uh, basically, uh, most people, when they think of a horse with a neurologic disease, they think about a wobbler. And basically, what is a wobbler? Uh, a horse that walks with a wobbling gait. And there are several uh, common causes, probably uh, the cervical stenosis, which we'll talk about this in a minute, is right here, equine herpes virus, which is uh, an infectious disease. We're gonna to get to that. EPM, which is a disease that is often causes asymmetric involvement with muscle atrophy, as you can see on the side of this horse's face. Um, with, with the, oh geez, no. Am I, am I sharing? You are? There it goes. There it is. Uh, today we're going to talk about CBM and uh, EHM. So uh, when you th think about things that horses do, and Lisa had some slides as well, that all of the different positions that a horse may have their neck in uh, during the athletic things that they're going to do. But the one the most common thing that we see as a cause of neurologic disease is what the, the bony abnormality in the neck referred to as cervical vertebral stenosis. So it's a narrowing of the spinal canal. It's a very common cause. It's usually a developmental problem and has multiple factors involved with it. It typically affects young light breed horses, uh, but we do see it in older horses as well where it uh, looks like it's uh, more of acquired osteoarthritis. And we'll look at some of the joints uh, on the side of the neck that can be treated uh, as Dr. Fortier mentioned, but in any uh, event, whether you see it in young or old horses, uh, the cause of the condition appears to overlap. Well, how do you diagnose it? Well, you start with a neurologic exam, and the most critical thing is you have a horse that's showing either weakness, uh, ataxia, meaning it's uh, very, very clumsy in how it moves, 
And if it's in the neck, it's going to involve all four limbs. And uh, with this condition, most of the time, it's a symmetric problem. Well, how do you diagnose it? Well, you can diagnose it with standing radiographs of the neck. And so here we're looking at the, there are seven cervical vertebrae in all mammals. So we're starting with C3 through C7. And we're looking at the uh, alignment of the vertebra. Hopefully that pointer is showing that. And um, the, the width of the vertebral canal. So the spinal cord would be living right in this space here. And we would like to uh, just in a general way know that the width of this canal is more than 50% of the width of the vertebral body. So if we made a measurement right here to here. And that's what these numbers are, are showing there. Uh, sometimes uh, the articular process joints can be quite arthritic. And um, so if you catch joints that are this bad, severely degenerative, the likelihood of getting a benefit from putting steroids or any biologic in those joints uh, is not likely to be very effective. But to make a more accurate diagnosis of a horse that has a narrow uh, spinal canal, we need to do a myelogram. And so here we have uh, radiographs, and this is the middle of the lower part of the neck. And what you're able to see is uh, the white right here is contrast that we've injected in to the uh, around the spinal cord. And you can see as you go down, right at the area between the fifth and sixth cervical vertebra, you have what looks like an hourglass uh, right here. So there's compression of the spinal cord there. And ways that we might diagnose it are measuring the uh, size of the dorsal contrast column. Uh, but the most critical way is looking at the the uh, total amount of uh, attenuation. So we might make a comparison uh, somewhere ahead of this to this. And we can see in this case, we have an 89% reduction. If we were to measure from here to here, we have an 89% reduction. So this is a, an example of a dramatically narrow spinal canal. So this is just another uh, schematic showing what it looks like on myelography. Uh, and you can see the this is the, the dorsal lamina or the top of the vertebra. And right here, you can see how much the contrast has been compressed both from the ventral and the dorsal side. Well, now, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, CT, which has been around for quite some time on people, has now been very, very helpful for us because now we can not only get a look at the lateral image, we can see the transverse images uh, and we can see when these articular uh, car, uh, processes are abnormal and that they might be pressing on the spinal cord from the side. So it's a very, very helpful to utilize the, the uh, contrast and the CT studies to look at it for lateralizing lesions or for lesions that are occurring from, from top to bottom. And then finally, uh, uh, an even more sophisticated way to look at it would be with MRI. There are very few magnets that will allow us to get a horse's neck in there. But if we could, this is what a spinal cord that's damaged might look like. So there's a lot of edema and swelling changes in appearance there of that. Well, what do we do if you have a horse that's a wobbler? If it's a very young horse, less than 10 months of age, I often, uh, because this is a multifactorial problem, and what are some of those factors? That we see this in young, rapidly growing, mostly males, three to one male over females uh, that grow to a large size. So it looks like there's uh, some genetic component to it because we do see it a little more in certain families, but it's not simple genetics. In other words, there does not appear to be one gene in the stallion and one in the mare that will made up to give you this. Diet, because diet has an impact on how bone forms. So, um, 
The bone is going to start out as a cartilage model and then be converted into bone. So if you have a diet, you want to make sure it's well balanced in calcium and phosphorus, as well as other trace nutrients. And there isn't a feed company around that doesn't uh, already pay attention to this and have diets that are readily available. So when people ask me what diet they should feed, I usually recommend they go to the company that they're already using and ask them what diet they have that's best for bone development. The third thing, uh, as I said, uh, uh, sex or gender, we see it in male over female. And, and then you don't want the horses to get too fat. So the other part of diet is watching uh, the amount of energy. If they're greater than 10 months of age, then there is Steve, a surgery. I, I don't think your slides are advancing, Steve. We're looking at treatment hyphen surgery. Okay. Uh, well, I didn't, I, I had a lot of, uh, I didn't show all the other one on the slide. It was just my words. Okay. So now we're okay. going to go to surgery. Sorry, but thanks, Lisa. Because I, I should have had that other, uh, another slide in there. But in, in any event, the, the, if they're older than 10 months of age, surgery is the way to manage them. And uh, that surgery is, uh, we use a, a fusion. And if you do uh, surgery, then afterwards, you're going to be putting them on stall rest for a month, then hand walking them. And then about a month later, uh, so three months after surgery, the horses are ready to go uh, back into some sort of, uh, of either turnout or active training. Well, that was a really rapid way of going through cervical stenosis. And if people have questions, uh, we can address that. But since I had two subjects to talk about, I decided I would limit that to, to just that number of slides. But the second part of what um, uh, Gary asked me to address today is equine herpes virus myeloencephalopathy, and certainly anybody who has either a racehorse or a show horse is likely to have heard about this particular problem. The virus itself is uh, equine herpes virus one. It's quite ubiquitous in horses, so it's a worldwide problem. 80% uh, of horses are estimated to be latently infected. Elimination of this particular virus is going to be very unlikely, and therefore, the, the whole focus of dealing with this particular problem has to be on control and prevention. And we'll talk in, in a little more depth in a minute about the clinical manifestations, but this virus can cause respiratory disease, abortions, neonatal deaths, uh, it can even cause damage in the eye. And finally, it can invade the nervous system and cause uh, this myelopathy. Well, with equine herpes virus, oftentimes there are multiple horses involved. And uh, generally, they'll uh, have a fever at some point in time. The fever is often biphasic, so it's not always recognized readily. Um, the, the clinical signs typically start in the pelvic limbs, but they can be anywhere. They're often ascend, and what you'll see is weakness and clumsiness with the pelvic limbs. Um, in addition to that, they lose sensation along the perineum, and they lose tail and anal tone, and frequently, in fairly short order, there'll be urine dribbling. Um, the virus affects the cells that line the blood vessels. And so uh, well, I'll show you some cartoons here in a minute of how it will get into the and invade and cause damage to the central nervous system. But once the horse has been infected, the virus gets picked up in uh, blood cells and then circulates throughout the body inside those cells. So it's a cell associated viremia. This is not a nice video, but it shows how dramatically affected these horses can be. So it might start as urine dribbling, as I mentioned, but it often progresses to recumbency. So how does equine herpes virus damage the nervous system? 
Well, this is the most critical thing. It causes damage to the blood vessels and induces stroke-like lesions. So um, let, let's just, the, remember I said about 80% of horses are once infected, will remain infected. So latent infections are very typical. So the virus can either be uh, from a naive horse that wasn't latently infected or it can reactivate from a latently infected horse. It will enter and damage the respiratory epithelium. So just like you or I might pick up a common virus uh, or cold, it then enters into white blood cells and circulates in the bloodstream. And while it's circulating along the wall of these blood vessels, it might cause damage to them and cause uh, there to be thrombi and that occlusion of that blood vessel is what causes the stroke-like signs. If it does that in the, uh, to the fetus in utero, it might then lead to an abortion. If it damages the central nervous system, it leads to neurologic disease. So these are just two cartoons showing a little bit about how that virus will spread. Well, how do we know when you have equine herpes virus myeloencephalopathy? Well, one thing is if you have a multiple horses affected, you're gonna be strongly suspicious. Another is you're going to do testing to eliminate other problems such as protozoal myelitis, which we're not gonna talk about today, but it is a fairly common cause of neurologic disease. Then you can do a spinal tap. And if they have had damage, the spinal fluid will be yellow like it is on this side compared to what's normal spinal fluid over here. Other things that you can do to diagnose it are PCR. And all of us are fairly familiar with PCR testing right now in light of uh, what we all know about COVID. Same type of testing can be done, done both on nasal swabs as a, again, just what we've been doing on ourselves for COVID, or you can do it on the blood, looking for uh, PCR in those uh, cells that have virus inside them. Treatment for this can be quite challenging. So antivirals, anticoagulants, anti-inflammatories are all going to be critical. So beyond the PCR test, the most definitive uh, tests. So we do PCR on blood and or nasal secretion, but the most definitive way to know it's there is to isolate the virus. This would be the gold standard. So that takes a, a pretty sophisticated laboratory to be able to grow this virus in cell culture, but it is an important thing to try. So if you get a PCR positive, you know the virus is present in the and it implies either current active infection or that there's been a recent viremia. PCR negative doesn't 100% rule it out, but it moves it well down the list if you're PCR negative. Serology can also be done looking for the antibodies, but that's going to take 10 to 14 days. And this is just a, a schematic of all of the things that are necessary to treat this. So we have the Antivirals down here, uh, probably uh, anybody who's unlucky enough to get fever blisters has used uh, Valtrex or Valcyclovir. Uh, acyclovir is not well absorbed in the horse, but if you give one of these other ones, it will be converted into that. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents such as aspirin or banamine flunixin are very helpful. Um, vitamin E, and you need to use a natural vitamin E helps nervous tissue heal. And then for secondary infections, you might have them on systemic antibiotics. In very, very rare instances, you might give one dose of something like a corticosteroid, but generally uh, you would not like to use steroids. The, this particular virus, the immunity following infection with this or even following vaccination only provides limited protection. And the, the reason for this is just like we're seeing in uh, life today, the virus it wants to avoid or uh, 
evade the immune system. So the virus will tend to mutate or modulate to get away from um, the uh, natural immunity that the uh, animal or the horse has produced. Um, so the best thing you can do is early recognition and then get those animals segregated from all other ones and closely monitor all the horses that are at high risks to prevent outbreaks from occurring. So epidemiologically, this is just another schematic. You've got latently infected horses. They might have a reactivation of the virus. The virus gets at the nose. It spreads to other young horses. Uh, and again, now you've established latency in, in more horses. And so this is how the virus circulates throughout all horses. The last thing that I wanted to mention about this is, is there a protecting vaccine for equine herpes virus uh, neurologic disease in the offing? Well, we would really like to hope that. We know that this virus causes damage to blood vessels, leading to vasculitis, thrombosis, loss of blood flow to organs. We know that right now there's not good published evidence that a vaccination will reduce the occurrence completely or the severity of equine herpes virus. So what would a desired vaccine look like? And I just wanna say right now, with the, uh, through the uh, benefit of uh, uh, an individual donor, the Jockey Club is going to be, has a call out there for research proposals to develop RNA vaccines. Another thing all of us have heard about. But what would a desired vaccine look like? Well, first of all, it would be safe. And that means uh, it, when you administer it, there wouldn't be any side effects and it would achieve high concentrations of neutralizing antibody. And you'd like those neutralizing antibodies to persist for a long time. It would prevent or eliminate that viremia. So it would prevent the virus from circulating throughout the body because once it circulates, that's when the damage can start. It would then prevent endothelial cell infection. It would stop latency and it would stop disease and viral shedding in latently infected horses. And then most critically, it would stop the vasculitis or the thrombosis that leads to the stroke-like signs that we see. And then the last two things we'd like in a perfect vac uh, vaccine would be, it would have very rapid onset and a very prolonged duration of immunity. And you'd like it to work in one to three injections, maybe one booster beyond that. But generally you would like it to, to be fairly rapid and quick in how it works. I might've gone too fast, Mike, but hopefully uh, if they have any questions, they can uh, uh, ask me at the end of the session. Yeah, we'll get to those questions in just a, a little bit after Dr. Bramlage fills us in on his presentation. But Dr. Reed, really appreciate that. Some wonderful insight there. And uh, if you do have a question for Dr. Reed, for Dr. Fortier, on what you've heard so far, you can submit it by clicking on the question and answer button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we will pass those along and get those answered for you in, uh, in very short order. Well, Dr. Bramlage, it's your time. We're gonna be talking confirmation and what is good confirmation and why on earth should we care? What's the answer? Well, I'm gonna talk about, since we are in the middle of the two-year-old training sale season, we've just come out of the yearling sale season. And um, when horses are being sold, people spend long hours peering at them from all different directions, whether you're in, um, uh, Europe, whether you're in Australia, whether you're in Lexington, um, whether you're in Saratoga, the evaluation of a horse's confirmation is a big part of whether you want to buy the horse. Now, I'm not going to talk about the confirmation that um, people are willing to um, give you an opinion on for a, a fee, and that's how the horse is made, the shoulder, the hip, all that. That's a different subject. I'm going to talk today just um, in a short uh, presentation on the confirmations that 
promote soundness. And I'm going to dwell on the carpi and the fetlocks because those are the most important uh, sites where we have injury. Now, it's intriguing. I, I'm, you know, I've been a practicing veterinarian for 47 years, and, and I'm still intrigued about how horses uh, are able to run every day. This is a high-speed video of a horse that's galloping on a dirt track. And if you watch the things that happen as the horse is galloping, it's extremely interesting. Now I'm gonna back this up if I can and get to the point where he's just planting his leg. So when a horse plants its leg, hey, this horse is on the left lead. He's already planted the, the right forelimb and the left limb is just coming down. Um, the, the fetlock joint goes into the cushion until the long pastern bone is parallel with the ground and is, is in extreme extension. But the knee locks and carries the weight through um, the horse's forelimb. Now, if I can uh, use the pointer and get a pin here. You have, if you're evaluating conformation, this part of the horse's limb from there out is muscle. So what we're looking at is the bone, which is on the inside half of the limb, goes right down through the middle of the knee, down through the cannon bone, through the fetlock joint, and then is transferred to the foot on the ground. The ideal conformation, you know, horses are very economical in their skeleton. They only have as much skeleton as they absolutely need to get around the racetrack because they build it in response to exercise. So the better we balance this horse over his skeleton, the less likely he is to get injured. And that's the whole uh, premise behind studying a horse's conformation um, while the horse is um, at the sail ring. So uh, I'm, I wanted to get rid of the pointer. pointer options. Hang on, sir. I'm sorry. Okay, now I can use my screen again. So as he's galloping, we need to watch how this joint locks whenever he puts his weight on it, and then it bends slightly backwards, and I'll come back to it. Just, just watch how he's going around the track. This is his, he's on the left lead. So his right forelimb is gonna come down first and all the weight's gonna be locked and go through that joint. It's also carried through the fetlock joint. So uh, the primary carpal deviations that we're looking for, the ones that we don't want are called varus, which is bow-legged, the offset knee, which I'll, talk about in a minute, and then back at the knee. Those are unsound conformations. They lead to injury, and I'm going to show you those. The, there are conformations that lead to inefficient motion, and if you, if you were trying to buy a racehorse, you want one that's efficient because he gets around the racetrack a lot faster. The, the two principal ones there are valgus, which is knock knee, and outward rotation of the limb, and I'll try to show you why. What conformation is ideal? Well, most horses aren't perfect, but most horses that are successful have reasonable conformation. The, the bone column goes, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go forward yet. Uh, the bone column comes right down through the inside of the leg, passes right through the center of the knee. Now pay attention to how this horse's knee sits in, I'm using the, the common term knee for the carpus, how it sits directly under the radius, right down through the cannon bone and right through the middle of the fetlock joint. So this horse has really good conformation in this forelimb. This limb has good conformation too, but I wanna make the point, note the shoeing on the left front. See what the shoeing has done? This coronary band is perfectly balanced. This one tips in a little bit. So this side of the hoof is a little longer than that side of the hoof. So we're actually creating toe in with shoeing. So people will talk about shoeing and it, it is important. It's not part of the innate horse 
but it helps us manage. And I'm going to leave the rest of the shoeing discussion to the farriers. Here's another horse. He's got perfectly good conformation. He toes out a little in the left front, but he's well within the degree of acceptability, both for soundness and for efficient motion. Here's one that has good, is good through the knees and he toes out a little, but that amount is, is perfectly acceptable. We just don't want it to be excessive. So here's a well-conformed yearling. Yearling conformations, this is a, a yearling this time of year. Yearling conformations are different than adult conformations or the ideal yearling conformation is different because we would like the yearling to be slightly knock kneed and slightly toe out. The reason we want that is because as he grows and his chest broadens, the elbows are going to get pushed out in relation to the shoulders. So if he looks perfectly straight as a yearling, he's going to toe in as an adult racehorse. So this is how a, a good, well-conformed yearling should look. He has good conformation. Now here's one that's not so good. This horse has an offset knee. That's what we refer to it as an offset knee. If you follow his radius, you go down to his joint, the rest of his limb moves out and then it comes down. What this does is increases the load on the inside of his limb. Now, um, I'm gonna make him walk here and I don't know if um, ho hopefully on my screen, um, the um, little postage stamps are over top of this, but while he's walking, the thing to pay attention to is how he loads the carpus, the knee. So I'm backing him up here. Watch when he loads on this knee, it bows out. See that? Now, even a small amount of bow out increases the load on the inside of the knee and, and this offset in his knee increases that possibility. The reason he's in the hospital is we need to get rid of that outward motion. And we can do that by making a little, him a little bit knock kneed. But here are, here are um, some more examples of horses in a minute. What, when the knees bow out, it increases the load on the inside of the knee here, on, on the inside of both carpi. And it's that joint primarily that we're worried about with the horses that have offset knees. Now this is that horse's radiograph. And you can see that this whole aspect of his leg is moved toward the outside. Why do we care? You keep loading that with that um, bowing type motion and it overloads these two bones. Here's examples of chip fractures in the distal radiocarpal bone. That's going to stop you. You need to stop and have surgery and take those out. But if he's got bad conformation, he's prone to doing that again. It also increases the load on the third carpal bone. And here's a chip fracture in the third carpal bone, a little more chronic chip fracture in the third carpal bone and an actual slab fracture. Those result from increased load on the inside of the knee of the carpus. We wanna avoid that if we can. So we don't want these horses that have offset knees or what's called carpal varus. Here's another example. I've got several of them here walking. Watch their legs bow out whenever they're walking. My postage stamps are over the yearling. Can you guys see the yearling walk? Yeah. You, you can, if you minimize your, um, I guess I could go to where I only see the there. So I'm gonna have him walk again. It, it's subtle when he's walking, but the knees are bowing out as he loads them. And that increases the load on the inside and that increases the chance that you're gonna have a carpal chip. Here's another horse. I mean, they come in all colors and sizes. You can watch this one walk. And you see this one, this left, right knee especially. When he walks, it bows out whenever he applies the load. And you can see the physis on the inside of his limb right here, it's actually thicker. That's an indication that he loads the inside of his limb heavier and you do not want to let that go through to maturity. We can, we can alter it as the horse is uh, growing. Now here's a, the next example. This is a chestnut horse that's galloping. 
what we can see easily on him is the two phase locking on the knee. Now watch this, lock back. It's a, the bottom joint locks here. And then you'll see the top joint right below the widest part of the knee bulge out a little bit. I'll back him up. I'm gonna stop him for a minute. The locking occurs in this lower joint because the collateral ligaments are back here. So that joint slams shut like the trunk on a li uh, lid on a trunk. It can't go any further. The top joint has a rounded back to it so it can bend backwards. So if, whenever a horse is getting tired at the end of the race and in a wind picture, you see their knees bent backward, that's happening at this joint. So pay attention to how he, how he goes. Lock, back. There he comes again. Lock, back. You see that, that second bulge right above the middle of his knee. That's happening at this joint. So what does that have to do with confirmation? Well, since he's, he's bowing backwards, you don't want to start him out with a backward bow to his leg. We commonly call this back at the knee. That back at the knee conformation occurs at the radial carpal joint where the amount of bend needs to be tolerable. And if you start him out at this position, he's gonna load the front of that joint higher. This is this horse's radiographs. Look at these two bones. Now I'm gonna compare him to a racehorse. <clears throat> See how they angle down on these radiographs? This is a, a racehorse that's here for a different problem. These accessory carpal bones are much more straightly aligned, parallel with the ground than these are. So this horse is gonna be back at the knee and what that does is put the axis of weight bearing closer to the front of this knee. We want it centered here. So that is an undesirable confirmation. Why? Because you bend that knee backwards enough times and this is what you get. You get these chip fractures of various sizes and shapes in the top joint. Now, this is a more tolerant site. We can take those out surgically and the horse gets along better. It, injuries here are less severe to the horse than injuries in the lower joint, but they're still not good. They limit their performance. So how about confirmations that make the horse inefficient? Carpal valgus, knock need conformation, looks like this. It causes inefficient motion. Watch this horse walk. He doesn't move his legs perfectly straight forward. He avoided the drain there, but we'll walk him again. When he walks, his motion tends to go like this. Now, if this is severe, it can predispose to injury, but the main problem is, is that's an inefficient motion and that reduces his athletic ability. So you wanna avoid carpal valgus if it's uh, to a significant degree because it gives you an inferior athlete. The same thing is true of a horse that rotates out like this. This horse's left front rotates out. This is pretty good confirmation in the right front, the left front rotates out. So it's gonna make him inefficient moving. We avoid that confirmation. What about fetlocks? Well, at this time of year, we're spending a lot of time looking at foals fetlocks. We're spending also a lot of time looking at yearlings knees, but these fetlocks stop growing at about four months and we don't want them to toe in like this. If the fetlocks toe in, you can see as this horse moves, you can see on his right front fetlock that the whole horse leans out a little bit over this fetlock joint. And that increases the, the biomechanical forces on the inside of the fetlock joint. And what happens then? Well, most horses that toe out have a little bit, especially when they're at that age, what we look for, they have an asymmetric epiphysis and a little bit longer medial aspect to the long pastern bone than the, the lateral aspect of the bone. And when that happens, this 
if, if they're varus, this part of the bone goes further up, hits the front of the cannon bone and causes chip fractures in the, in the inside aspect of their knee. So you don't want fetlock varus or toed in horses either because it increases your chances to get this. Now, all horses can get chip fractures in any location really, but the good conformation minimizes your chances that the horse is gonna do that. Most horses are born crooked, but as phenomenal as those videos are of a horse that's galloping, as equally as interesting as what happens in a horse's growth plate as they're growing and that there's a self-correction mechanism of foals that cause them to become straighter and straighter with time. If it didn't do that, we'd have lots of ugly legged horses because very rarely is a horse born perfectly straight. So the growth helps, but the two places we need to step in and improve the situation is if he doesn't have enough growth left to correct his deformity, or sometimes the genetic template or the inherited conformation is not ideal. Horses highly inherit toed in and offset knee conformation. So we have to do things. If, if the mare is, is producing that in the foal, we have to negate it somehow. How do we do that? Well, if the horse is bow-legged, we stop the growth on the inside and let, and, and uh, I'm sorry, yes, if the horse is um, too long on this side, the medial side, this, is, this would be a valgus conformation. We stop the growth on the inside and allow the outside to grow further. You can stop it with screws and wires, which we use in younger yearlings. You can stop it with a screw here. This is on the outside of the knee. And this would be for those bow-legged horses that I showed you, this would be how we would stop them. You stop this growth and then it grows a little longer here and it bends the leg back in the other direction. I didn't mean to go forward yet. Same thing true of the fetlock joints. This, horse, this foal toes in, so you stop the growth on the inside and you let the outside growth push him back out. What we're looking for is this. This is the conformation we want in foals. They're a little bit knock-kneed. They look a little bit knock-kneed, but actually the bony column is good and they rotate out. Foals rotate out because as they grow, the elbows get pushed out as the chest widens. So if these are going, you know that all foals are gonna turn these feet towards each other. So that's why we want them to look like this. If he looks perfectly straight through the fetlock joints, when the elbows push out, he's gonna to toe in. So this is, these are the conformations we're looking at in foals. Now offset knees and fetlock varus or, or fetlock toe in, those are additive they will both increase the probability of injury at both joints. You can, you can really see him lean out on those joints as he walks. The motion is, is very obviously loading the inside of the joint heavier. And if you look at his growth plates, he's thicker here on his growth plate on the inside. That, that gives you an indication of what's going to happen when he's racing. He's going to load the inside of the limb. So this horse is here for correction of his conformation. We need to stop the growth here. You need The growth plates in the knee stop growing at about 18 months of age. So we concentrate on getting those correct at about a year of age. The growth plates in the fetlock joints stop growing at about four months of age. So we have to get the foals correct before that period of time or we can't use growth manipulation. So the reason we manipulate conformation is to make a sounder horse. Here's a, here's a um, uh, offset knee, but no toe in. This horse is, um, Fetlock joints are good. He doesn't have any problem there, but his knees are not. He's varus in his knees, and he's that obvious bowed out motion whenever he's moving. Now, sometimes in foals, there's another condition where the conformation is so bad that the, it overwhelms the growth mechanism, and they, the self-correcting mechanism 
can't make progress. And that's the situation with this fold. He's crooked and he's not getting better. He's getting better on this leg, straightening out, but this one is not. And, and if, the, if the angulation is too heavy, without going into so much, uh, too much detail, but there's a, there's a pathologic limit to the correction mechanism. So we have to help him. You can't just turn him out, he'll keep getting worse. So what we do with those is, this is that full. You can see he bows like this. This is the transficeal bridge being put in. That arrests the growth here, allows him to grow faster here. And then this is the radiograph of him five weeks later. He now is balanced over top of his knee and we can treat him like a normal foal. So we're spending a lot of time manipulating growth right now. And you can see the, these are our surgery texts demonstrating carpal valgus. <laughs> but we're, you have to correct foals when they're under four months of age and you have to correct the carpi around a year of age. And the reason to correct them there's, there's always a lot of um, discussion. It's, it's finally kind of, we finally matured to understand that the reason to correct them, to make them sell better is to make them better athletes and less likely to have an injury. So I'll stop and I'll stop, uh, stop sharing and go back to the group. All right. All right. Well we done, good? Doc. Really appreciate that. That was uh, wonderful information. And again, a question for Dr. Bramlage, go ahead and submit it using the Q&A button at the bottom of the uh, Zoom screen. And we'll go ahead and get to those coming up here in just a minute. That is going to conclude the presentation part. And it is just about time to open it up for your questions. Uh, Gary Falter will rejoin us to do that. But first, a word from Blood Horse, our question and answer sponsor. Blood Horse Plus, available through bloodhorse.com, provides exclusive, timely, and unmatched content to subscribers, including Fox Sports, Blood Horse branded weekly programs, a detailed stakes winners section, behind the scenes videos from Blood Horse staff, on demand access to deeper horse statistics, and a $5 monthly credit to equineline.com. Upgrade to Blood Horse Plus today. Okay, uh, thanks uh, for all the presentations. I'm gonna jump right into the question. So uh, here's one, I'm not even sure what this is, but I'm gonna ask the question. Is kissing spine ever a problem? If yes, what are the treatment options and outcomes? So does anybody have knowledge on kissing spine? Well, I'll take a shot at it. If um, the, the answer is, is it ever a problem? The answer is yes. It's a problem for some horses. Is it always a problem? No. Um, what kissing spines are is on the top of a horse's spinal column, there are projections of the vertebrae that should look like a picket fence. And if the spinal column bows down, the top of those vertebrae get close together and start rubbing on each other. Now I can't move the bottom of my fingers apart like Spock could, but um, the tops touch. It's much more a problem in jumpers than it is in racehorses, but it, it is a problem in racehorses sometimes. It's also a problem in some stallions. Um, but if you have the problem, it depends on the severity. Um, and in racehorses where we usually pick it up early, they are commonly responsive to injection and shockwave. And uh, the interesting thing is, is once they are kissing or rubbing for a while, a lot of them will get a false joint and then they're no longer painful. So they're most painful when they first occur. But in jumpers, they're a lot more of a problem because obviously they have to use their spine a lot more than racehorses do running in a straight line. Uh, there's also a surgical option for it, but that really doesn't apply to racehorses. It is uh, potentially useful. There are several different methods um, in jumping horses, and I'm sure Lisa has experience with those as well. I, I agree. It, within the thoroughbred racehorse industry, I think you covered it, Larry. Okay, uh, next question. Um, how can we address the steroid option with trainers who may be very old school? 
it's really uh, subject. <laughs> it's really building trust with that trainer. Uh, it's building a relationship. You, uh, obviously, you just can't go in and say, you know, I don't think we should do this. Explaining, you know, why they might be seeing a benefit. And I'm not saying you shouldn't ever use steroids. I'm just saying you have options. And when it's getting closer to race or meet time, that maybe you should really consider avoiding them. Um, and, and going towards biologics or arthromid, I mean, you could sell it easily as you never want to test positive, but it also is for the longevity and for the betterment of the, of the horse as well. But it's really about building trust with that, with that trainer and the owner. Okay. Okay, here's a question. The horse Shamardal was diagnosed as a wobbler as a yearling and went on to become a group one winner in Europe. Um, how common is it for horses to uh, get over being a wobbler? That's a fair question. As I mentioned a little while ago, I usually uh, will try conservative management in uh, horses that are less than uh, 10 months of age. Um, you know, I, I'm familiar with that horse because I performed the monogram on him to diagnose this problem. And uh, the horse then went um to the the actual insurance company ended up taking ownership of the horse and they um you know they took the attitude um that if a horse could grow into being a wobbler it could eventually grow out of it as well and so with time um that horse did a lot of remodeling and was indeed able to remodel the vertebral canal to a, an extent that um there was no longer pressure on the spinal cord, allowing it to go ahead and be uh, not only a, a successful racehorse, but obviously successful breeding stallion. Right, okay. Um, here's one for Dr. Fortier. Is PRP joint injection regulated on the racetrack? No, it is not. It, uh, as I suggested in the discussion, uh, it, it, the World Anti-Doping Association at first was concerned that it could be a type of blood doping since it's made from blood. Uh, and so it was originally banned. I forget what year it was. I'm going to say like 2014. And then several experiments after that, mostly because of the concern of growth factors, growth hormone that could be given back in, in the platelet-rich plasma. But then WADA, the World Anti-Doping Association, said it's fine. Okay. There, there are some racing jurisdictions that disallow joint injections for a period of time before a race. So in that instance, it would, it would be regulated. And it's not always the same. It's, it's up to two weeks in some places. It's a matter of days in others. So as Lisa said, it's not an illegal compound, but you're not allowed to inject joints close to a race in, in most jurisdictions. Okay. Um, here's one for Dr. Reed. Do we know the source of EHV1 or where it came from? Well, it's, that, this is a virus that's been recognized for uh, centuries. And so the, the virus itself uh, has been around for many centuries. And in fact, uh, what we've been concerned about lately has been a mutation uh, that occurred in that virus. And one of the arguments, Dr. George Allen, when he was here, still living, uh, now deceased at the Gluck Research Center, thought that the mutation that so many people have been concerned about might have occurred about the time the Spaniards reintroduced the horse to North America, and so a long, long time ago. The, the, the key point that's really uh, critical about it is that mutation appears to make the virus have what would be commonly described as replicative aggressiveness. So the, the virus replicates very, very rapidly, which means that it's going to be, if it's at the nose and horses are in close contact and it's replicating rapidly, it can be easily spread from horse to horse. And that's why uh, it, it can move so rapidly at either a racetrack or a showgrounds. Okay. Um, here's a question about foals. How do you know if a foal has had an injury or if it's a genetic problem? Well, if, if it's related to the neck, uh, I think that's a really fair question. A lot of people worry when you get a wobbler, was this traumatically induced or was this a developmental problem? And I think with the diagnostic methodologies that we have now, you can sort it out. 
Now, Dr. Forty and Dr. Bramlage may refer to similar things in the appendicular skeleton about, uh, you know, how you would separate one from the other. Well, simply put, injuries usually have inflammation associated with them. Genetic diseases do not. Um, and so it could be an injury in the past, perhaps in some situations, but um, you know, um, radiographs, the inflammation both clinically and radiographically would be important. And I think your veterinarian should be able to, to get you close on that answer. Okay. Uh, since horses develop bone based on how we work them, is it better to train them counterclockwise like we do for racing? And does that hurt them for their racing careers? Um, Lisa, do you want to take that or you want me to come <laughs> Go ahead. Um, there are some diseases, notably uh, stress fractures in the metacarpus that are um, left-handed. In other words, the horse gets it more commonly in the left front than they do in the right front. And that's presumably because we race in a uh, counterclockwise direction. Um, in Europe, they race the opposite direction, but they don't have nearly the number of those because they're more common on dirt tracks than they are on grass tracks. There, it, it's not an all or none. It doesn't hurt your horse to train it counterclockwise. The answer to that is no. And in fact, if you're trying to increase the amount of um, cardiovascular fitness, there's something to be said for going both directions. But in practicality, the horse is adapting to what you're giving them. So for the most part, you want him adapted to racing counterclockwise. And so I think that the, I, the idea of going both directions is more related to needing to train the heart and lungs, which is rarely the limiting system in the horse. The skeletal system is almost always the limiting system. So um, to some degree, yes, um, as far as splitting the training equally, no, they need to go left-handed, which is how they're gonna run. Okay, uh, we're getting on to a couple more questions. Um, how about this one? As an owner, I often receive veterinary bills for my horses being scoped immediately after they race. Can you tell us why endoscopic procedures are routinely performed and what the vet is looking for? Well, I, I think number one, they'd be, uh, you know, when they're scoping them immediately after a race, I would assume that's because a horse uh, didn't perform to the level they were expecting. And at that time, they're looking for something uh, in the upper airway, whether they uh, had displaced their soft palate or they had an epiglottic entrapment where the uh, epiglottis is become entrapped in the tissue from underneath it, uh, or maybe uh, they're concerned about some other upper airway obstruction. If they wait 45 to 60 minutes after the race to scope them, they're looking for evidence of uh, exercise-induced pulmonary hemorrhage. So they're looking, was the horse a bleeder? And did that have a role in why it may not have performed? Those are probably the two most simple and logical reasons for endoscopy post-race. Okay. Uh, here's somebody asking to discuss the relationship between owners and veterinarians. Do they ever discuss treatments with owners or is the relationship always between the trainer and the veterinarian? Do we discuss treatment with owners? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do we, do we discuss treatments more often with trainers? Yes. Yes. We, we try to keep our owners informed of everything we're um, talking to the trainers about, but as a matter of routine, most owners empower the trainers to make the decisions because they're better informed. Uh, and so that's purely a discussion that needs to happen between the trainer and the owner, more so than the veterinarian. The primary contact person that we use is the one that calls and makes the appointment. But we always include the owner on every written communication so they know what's going on. Um, so I think it, it's an individual situation that you have to work out with your trainer if, if you um, want to be more involved with the decisions. I agree. And if it's a new trainer, 
Uh, I'll specifically ask, would you like me to reach out to the owner or would you like to communicate that further? Sometimes they might not understand that we don't reach out without really asking the trainer first, but the owner is always welcome to reach out to us as well. Yeah, that's the same with us, but the person who gets the bill virtually always gets a written report with us. Uh, um, I mean, because owners are going to pay, they're going to have uh, some response to um, to what uh, some information as to what happened. Okay, I think we'll wrap up the questions on that last question. I want to thank you all, Dr. Fortier, Dr. Bramage, Dr. Reed, just really appreciate your time and your insights. I always find these discussions just uh, fascinating myself. Mike, thanks a lot for hosting things. I wanted you close things out from now. Yeah, my pleasure, Gary. And I'll echo those thank yous to, uh, to all three panelists here today. Really appreciate it, doctors. It was very informative and I think uh, People thoroughly enjoyed it. I want to thank our sponsors of today's panel, Mersant International and OCD Pellets. And uh, most of all, thank all of the owners who joined us for this today, because without you and you putting up your hard-earned money to support the sport, uh, we don't have a sport. We don't have an industry. So thank you very much for that. And uh, we'll have another panel coming up online in September. So until then, um, good luck at the races. I hope you find yourself in the winner's circle quite often. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Bye now.